happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. to serve as Mistress of Ceremonies this morning. We will have, if everyone could be seated, we will have the color, color Guard present the flag. Color Guard. I pledge allegiance You may be seated. Oh, uh, hello. I didn't mean talk. I just meant be seated. Thank you. It gives me a great deal of pleasure to, before you guys start eating, to present the dais to my far right, Re Reverend Jesse Herring, beside her, my good friend, Senator Doris Turner, 
Congresswoman Nikki Buzinski, U.S. Senator du Dick Durbin, our speaker who will be presented. The individual who's going to present the speaker will be presented. <laughs> <laughs> to my far left, Father George. Narai, Narai, I'm sorry, Narai French. Doris Galbraith. Ruby Davis. and some of us don't need any introduction, <laughs> Mayor Busher, thank you so much. <laughs> I believe that the food will be served momentarily, am I correct? Yeah, I get a thumbs up, momentarily. So, uh, while that's happening, uh, I'm going to ask Father George. Now, in your uh, uh, programs, he's known beyond Father George. He gave me permission to call him Father George because, although I'm hooked on phonics, I wasn't very good about pronouncing his name, his last name. So, I give you Father George for the invocation. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very, very happy in this beautiful morning just to address this invocation and ask God to bless us. At this annual breakfast, I would like to share with you the voice of Martin Luther King, Jr. With the faith we will be able to go to carve a tower of hope on the mountain of despair and bring into being that great dream and create right here in America a nation where all will be living together and respect the dignity and worth of human personality. Almighty God, we gather to honor and give thanks to you for the life, ministry, words of justice in the face of Martin Luther King, whose witness pointed to the fear and the ignorance underlying prejudice and intolerance that leave people at the door of society and the church and deny God among us and in each of us. Thank you for giving Martin Luther a vision and a message of deliverance and equality as found in his words. I have the courage to believe that people everywhere can have three meals a day for their bodies, education and culture for their minds, and dignity, equality, and freedom for their spirits. I believe that what self-centered men have torn down, other centered men can build up. On this day, we remember Martin Luther King, a minister of the gospel of Jesus, and your servant committed to peace and non-violence who was killed as he invited us to become a nation of greater justice and equality and who was not an easy presence just as Jesus was not an easy presence speaking truth to the powerful. On this day when there is too much hatred and greed, let us become 
as Martin, instrument of peace and love. There is too much of pride and arrogance that keeps us at war. Let us become, as Martin, people of humility and service and bring peace. There is too much of bullying and words of violence in our, hum in our homes, schools, streets. Let us become, as Martin, those who have no need to bully or seek violence but the faithful to trust you and your reconciling love. Now as we partake of this meal from the bounty of your creation, O oh God, give us a hunger for justice and a thirst for peace and bless each one present here and the food that we are about to eat. We make in the name of Jesus Christ this prayer through Christ our Lord. Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Father George. Now, you heard me say that he'd given me permission to call him Father George. You all have to practice his last name and call him by his last name. <laughs> you want me to say it? <laughs> they want you to say your last name so that, that you, you, they get it right, right? Okay. <laughs> Friends, once again, it's my honor to tell me, tell you my full name. That is, just call me Father George. <laughs> however, however, I am pleased to, to share with you my last name. It is Nelly Kumail. That's right, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, don't look at me like that. Ah, don't do that, don't do that. If you look at the book, it looks like it might rhyme with tunnel. Don't do that. Okay. So now you know. It's on you. Because I get to call him Father George. Um, you know, I would be remiss, as I look around this room, if I didn't ask each of you to give yourselves a round of applause. It is minus something out there. And you're all, this room is packed. This room is packed. That's a testament to your will. It's also a testament to the work that the Frontiers International Springfield Club does in this community. Thank you so much for being here. Next we'll have a welcome from Yoke Fellow Larry Hemingway, who is the president of the Frontiers International Springfield Club. He's on his way, he's making his way to the podium. While he's coming up, I, uh, I have a joke. Okay, so, this came to me in a dream. So, Cat Williams. So, what did the lion say to the bear? I don't know because it would be hearsay.
and not being a newcomer to this business, I thought, I'm going to go over and sit with the kids. I bet that's on the news tonight. So I went over to sit with the kids, and the television cameras went with me. And as I arrived at the table, this little girl, first or second grade, looks up and says, who are you? <laughs> and I said, my name is Dick Durbin. What do you do? Well, I'm a United States Senator. And she said, well, good for you. <laughs> absolutely humbles the exalted, <laughs> as it should. You know why I came here and why I make a point, if it's even physically possible to be here? I would say, Mayor, this is the most diverse gathering in the city of Springfield each year. By far. By far. And as many of you braved record-breaking cold temperatures to be here this morning, in the past I have seen the same snowstorms the night before, all sorts of things. People make a point of coming here because we feel like a community. There are some people who argue that diversity is not important. You won't hear that from me. There's a great woman named Marion Wright Edelman who once said, you can't be what you can't see. You can't be what you can't see. I'm now the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee in Washington. And I will tell you that we've had an opportunity to appoint individuals to the federal judiciary and to many other posts in, in the federal government involving the Department of Justice. I didn't see him this morning, but I hope Bob Moore is here. He heard the other business and said that. You know, fellow Bob Moore. Not here. Not here this morning, but I don't want to pay tribute to him anyway. He was the first full-time African-American U.S. Marshal in the history of the Central District of Illinois. He was a the <laughs> Greg Harris, are you here? Yeah. Looking for Greg. Greg, Greg. Greg, thank you for being here. The first African-American U.S. Attorney in the Central District of Illinois. Congratulations for being here. Diversity is critically important, and in this third year of this presidency, we have appointed more women of color to the circuit bench in the United States of America than in the entire history of the United States. <laughs> and in this you can't be what you can't see. Katanji Brown Jackson, the first African American woman ever appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court. There's nothing wrong with holding my cows like myself getting an occasional job. <laughs> but let's be honest about it. If we truly believe in diversity, and that is what brings us here this morning, we know that we have to be willing to stand up for it. And for some people, it means taking a little step back so that someone finally gets a chance. That's why I'm here this morning. And I will tell you, my good friend who passed away recently, John Lewis, who was a pioneer of the civil rights movement. John Lewis used to say, ready to make trouble, good trouble, good trouble. Dr. Martin Luther King made good trouble. He made us feel uncomfortable because he pointed to our own shortcomings and weaknesses. But I'm inspired by him as you are, and I'm glad that we're here to make true to him. It's my honor to introduce still the new Congresswoman from this Congressional District, my Congresswoman, Nikki Budzinski.
of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And we all know that Dr. King committed his life to working against the deep-rooted racism in this country, and we all know that that still exists. That is still a struggle that we have. He lost his life standing up for his dream of freedom, justice, and equality for all. And today we remember the incredible progress, as I said, that we have made in our communities in this country, and the work that was done that brought about the civil rights movement that still inspires us to this day. And we remember the countless others who put their lives on the line, just like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. did, to advance his cause. Their work helped to pass, as I said, the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, and to protect the rights of every American. Every American should be afforded to have the, the access to the ballot box. And we still fight every day um, to make sure that we are protecting those rights. And we know today, just equally as we gather, that the work that he really led, led us to, this work is still unfinished. And you can bet that I will always stand with you as we do this hard work of rooting out systemic racism and advancing equity in, for all of our communities of color. One place in particular in my first year in office that I've been very proud to help lead with the leadership of Senator Durbin is addressing the long-standing flooding and sewage crisis that's happening in Cahokia Heights, just about an hour and a half south of where we sit here today, where a largely black community has been failed by government for too long and for too many years. I was glad to help secure, as a part of my first year in office for this community, a federal EPA administrator coordinator to help us improve the response to this situation for a community for too long that has been in desperate need. And just this past week, I advocated for additional resources to address the infrastructure that is failing this community not far from us. But here in Springfield, I am continuing my efforts to make the site of the Springfield Race Rides from 1908 a national monument. And together, let us work to make that a reality. Yes. I have introduced in support of this initiative legislation with Congressman Darren Wood, um, with the great leadership that we have in the Senate with Senator Durbin and Senator Duckworth to get this designation finally overdue and complete. And I've been working actively to advocate within the White House to also make this a reality. And we can't get this done through a legislative route. But I want to also highlight in Springfield that I've been working to lift up projects like CAP 1908 Innovation and Co-working Center to help prioritize in the Springfield community black small business entrepreneurship. And supporting the moving Pillsbury Forward project to help further economic development on the east side of Springfield. And so today, again, I want to say a thank you to all of you for inviting me to be here for Frontier, Frontiers International, because today is about honoring, again, the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the work that has been done, and the work that I said we still have ahead of us for equity and justice. And you can always count on me to be your partner in that very critically important work. So thank you so much. And it is my incredible honor to introduce now to the podium my good friend, State Senator Doris Turner. Jr. did what he 
he did is because he always wanted us to see first the humanity in ourselves so that we could then see the humanity in others and work towards that, work towards that. So I would hope that that is the reason why we come out and we gather. I was, um, when I sat down and saw at the front of the program, and it says, in times of challenge, we will stand. I think that all of us can agree that we are definitely in times of challenge. We're in times of challenge in the world. We're in times of challenge in the United States. We're in times of challenge in our state and in our city. So what are we going to do to stand in that time of challenge? So what I would encourage everyone to do, and what I'm going to ask you to do, is when you get ready to, to leave here, after you have enjoyed your breakfast, after you have heard the wonderful speakers, think about that introvert looking at the humanity in you, and what are you going to do starting today and each and every day to see the humanity in others and in these times of challenge, take a stand and do the right thing always. And I would invite um, Mayor Steve Thank you, Senator. Good morning, everyone. First of all, thank you to the Frontiers International for doing this lovely breakfast every year for many, many years. Thank you to the staff of the London for always providing such a delicious breakfast to all of us. And I would like to take a minute to acknowledge the folks in the room if you don't mind. In the back of the room, the city of Springfield has a table of first responders, Springfield and Springfield Fire, which please join. There's a table of directors from the city of Springfield. Can you all please wave that are here to represent us as well? And I've seen throughout the room some city council members, so please raise your hands if you are here. Thank you for being here. And then I would like to invite every elected official just to kind of raise their hand and let everyone see who's here as an elected official. This breakfast has uh, commenced for 49 years, which to me is a very, very thing to do to the international, hosting this for 49 years. The diversity, as we talked about in this room, Senator Urban did on that, is very, very important. This is what Dr. King wanted to see right here. The diversity in this room. Each of us working together, regardless of our political background, our race, our sex, our national origin, but we're working together for unity. As the Senator Trevor pointed out, the front of the bureau does say, in times of the challenge, we will stand. Please take your remarks to heart and remember how to make us stand together, regardless of our political affiliation, our race, our sex, and our nationality, original nationality, where we were born. We are all here together today. Let's figure out how we're going to stand together and to do good things together as a community. I'm honored to be here on um, my first Martin Luther King Arrest as Junior Mayor at this event many times before, but I'm not Junior Mayor. Our administration is diverse, and we continue to work towards making the footprint of your community diverse. So thank you and enjoy your breakfast.
Congress. I hope that you will hear from me today that will enable you to go forward and make change in the community and in your own life. Thank you for your monetary support and thank you for taking the time to come out and be with us today. In closing, I would like to thank Joe Kett, Ernestine Marks, for referring me and as the Frontier International Supreme Club for the privilege as well as the pleasure to be you this program. So now, step back, enjoy the rest of the program, be safe, God bless, and thank you. Perspective on standing up for myself. 
voicing my beliefs and embracing my identity as an African American. Dr. King, a civil rights leader, advocated for the rights and equality of an African Americans during the civil American Civil Rights Movement in the 1950s and 1960s. He was a key proponent of nonviolent activism. Drawing inspiration from Mahatma Gandhi's philosophy in 1964, Martin Luther King Jr. was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts in combating racial inequality through nonviolent means, making him the youngest recipient of the prize at that time. His legacy endures, and he is remembered as a symbol of courage, justice, and the ongoing struggle for civil rights and equality. <clears throat> Dr. King's I Have His Dream speech and his leadership forever changed history. As of today, January 15, 2024, he would have been 95 years old. Despite progress, racism persists. Rather than resentment, we pray for those with racist views seeking a healing in my, of mindsets and forgiveness. Thanks to Pastor Patricia Herring and St. John's AME Church for hosting our group. Gratitude to Dr. William D. Rosen, pastor of Pleasant Grove Baptist Church, for supporting the Junior Frontiers Club. Our collaboration fosters positive change. The support allows young minds to flourish and learn and contribute to society. As we continue, let's embrace unity and understanding. Stand against racism, advocating for a world where character defines a person irrespective of their skin color. <clears throat> in closing, I invite you to join hands in the effort towards positive youth development and societal changes. Together we build a future where Dr. King's dream becomes a reality. Thank you for your time and commitment. I know, I know it's a cliche, but that's our future and I'm okay with it. It takes courage to come up here and intelligently talk. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Next, we will have the Community Service Award presentation by President Larry Hemingway and Kevin Corbin. Now, before Kevin comes, sometimes I call him Kenny. <laughs> yeah, of course there's a story behind that. I'm gonna tell the story. Okay, I'm gonna tell the story. So we were at the uh, African American History Museum uh, Gale. So Kevin has a, such a big heart and he's He's so obedient, because he could be my son. I know, I don't love him. <laughs> so, I, I, you know, the women were going up to the stage, the, the MCs, there were two of them. And, you know, I said, Kevin, can you, can you go and, and help them up? And he said, sure. So he's helping him up, and one of them says, comes down, and she says, thank you, Kenny. <laughs> so I've been calling him Kenny ever since. <laughs> but he's Kevin Corbin. mention was that was on a wide mic so the audience was about as big as this so everybody called me Kitty the whole rest of the night. <laughs> Again good morning I echo everyone. Thank you for breaking the code and joining us for our 49th annual MLK breakfast. Also thank you for supporting our youth mentoring programs. Speaking of support our Community Service Award recipient this year is Dr. Ruby Davis. Dr. Ruby Davis. That's all right, we can now. Thank you.
Dr. Ruby Davis has over 20 years of experience in the funeral industry. Ruby was born and raised in Drew, Mississippi, to Lake Clarence and Marcolo Brandon. She relocated to Springfield in 1984 with her husband. Ruby has two children and five grandchildren. She is a graduate of Springfield South Beach High School. Well, wait, there's more. Homeless Spartans. From homeless, homeless to business owner, Dr. Ruby is honored to be the first white female funeral home owner in Springfield, Illinois. And the first black female printer award in the state of Illinois. She was on the board of the Chamber of Commerce for four years, honored at the African American History Museum Gala, honoring our heritage program, received the President's Award at the NAACP Lincoln Douglas Banquet. She has conducted a pre seminar for several organizations, churches, and the downtown Abraham Lincoln Library. She always indicates that seminar resources are available to the community. Dr. Ruby has completed the second phase of her vision for the recreation of the community center and banquet hall to open to the community. No matter the obstacles she's faced in life, she has prevailed. All her success is open to God, and she looks forward to what's to come in her life and business. So join me to give me a big round of applause and congratulations, Dr. Ruby Davis.
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Let's not forget, on the piano, is uh, Ezra Casey, Pleasant Grove Baptist Church. I have the pleasure of introducing the gentleman who is going to introduce the speaker. And of course, I have a story. <laughs> so last night, I was presented with his bio. And I'm reading through it. And I was stumbling across epidemiologists. <laughs> See how I sounded that out? <laughs> anyway, as it would happen, and you know, I believe in, in the powers of God. The bio was misplaced. So this morning I found out, well, you don't have his bio. So I'm panicking. But then I was sent the bio in a, a Word document that I can't open on my phone. <laughs> That's not the end of the story. So I mentioned earlier that I'm Morgan's mom. So I text Morgan. I said, Morgan. Send me Dr. John Flack's bio. What did he do? He sent it. <laughs> Let me say this. And, and I, this is an observation that I just made with regard to Dr. Flack. He introduces himself as John Flack. Not Dr. John Flack. He doesn't stand on ceremony. You know why? Because he doesn't have to. This is an individual who has like seven, seven sets of initials behind his name. You don't get seven sets of initials behind your name unless you put in the work. He has put in the work. John Flack is a board certified internal medicine specialist and an American Society of Hypertension certified clinical hypertension specialist. He completed an NI he completed an NIH postdoctoral fellowship in cardiovascular, there's that word again, epidemiologist. D. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. At the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. He received internal medicine residency training as well as his medical degree from the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center, where he was elected to Alpha Omega Alpha Medical Honor Society. He also served as chief medical residence, res, his chief res, as chief medical resident at OU. Dr. Black also received a bachelor's degree in chemistry. He's smart. <laughs> From Langston University, where he lettered for four years in baseball and one year on the football teams. Now, that wasn't in what I had last night. Okay, so that's good. <laughs> Talk about well-rounded? Let's do that. Among his many honors, Dr. Flack has been repeatedly named top to top doctors, Detroit Super Doctors, and honor an Our Magazine Best Doctors list. He was honored as Academic Physician of the Year from Oklahoma University School of Medicine and as a Detroit News Michigan Year of the Year in 2009. He was also awarded the American Heart Association Ethically to Drill Award for Excellence and was recognized as Crane's Detroit Business Healthcare Hero Award for Outstanding Physician Achievements. But let me get down to this. And it's not to the exclusion of my Caucasian counterparts, but every African American in this room needs to be aware of this. He has special expertise in the diagnosis and treatment of secondary forms of hypertension. That's high blood pressure. Yep. 
difficult to control, resistant, hypertension, and hypertension in African Americans. He's dedicated to improving patient outcomes. He is actively involved in testing new drugs and devices for the treatment of resistant hypertension. Dr. Flack's research also suggests that vitamin D, a safe, cheap, and readily available over-the-counter supplement, is useful in helping overweight of African Americans with hypertension and severe vitamin D deficiency lower their blood pressure and lose weight. I'm in that category. There could be no better individual to introduce our speaker than this learned individual that I bring before you, Dr. Black. Uh, well, thank you for, for the introduction. Uh, you know, this day is a, is a very special day, obviously. And uh, I, uh, I grew up in Oklahoma a friend's in Southern State. And I was a baby of the Civil Rights era. And even though my family never really wanted for much, I can tell you during the Civil Rights turbulence, my dad's business almost collapsed because his customers just quit coming in. And, and yet, there was help that came from someone in the insurance industry who you would have never imagined in the 60s would help them and help you survive. The 60s was a turbulent time. Four assassinations, including Dr. King's. I remember coming home from a scout meeting, hearing about it. Um, and we continue to struggle to this day to make this a more perfect union and a just and equitable, a more just and equitable society. So thank you all for coming. It's a tremendous pleasure for me to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Wendy Wilson-Levine, a uh, friend and an uh, esteemed colleague. Uh, she's the Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Southern Illinois University School of Medicine. And if you've been paying attention to what DEI has been subjected to by all kinds of provocateurs recently, you know that her job is a, not only a needed job, but a very tough job. She's a professor at SIU School of Medicine in the Department of Family and Community Medicine, where she has a clinical practice. Um, and she's also duly appointed at the SIU Department of Medical Education, where she serves as an academic strategist. Prior to coming to SIU, she was an assistant dean of medical education uh, at the University of Virginia School of, of Medicine in Charlottesville. And she serves as director uh, of the outreach on the Center for Health Disparities and was director of the University of Virginia Cancer Center Health Disparity Initiative and was an assistant professor of medicine, family medicine, and public health um, there. Um, and she took a brief stand in private practice for a few years at the uh, Wills Diagnostic Clinic in Houston, Texas. She completed her, her uh, residency in family medicine and community medicine and served as chief resident of the University of Texas, Houston um, in 2001. And she earned her degree from Georgetown Medical School and a bachelor's degree in biology from historically black uh, Hampton University in Virginia. She's board certified in family medicine and is a member of the Medical, National Medical Association. Um, and she chaired the women's health section between 2008 and 2019. She's been a community health advocate and activist and is a proud mother of three daughters, Samira, Ariana, and Yasmin who she affectionately calls her birth wind and fire. <laughs> She's presently a board member of the Community Foundation of the Land of Lincoln, Springfield YMCA, and also on the board of the Springfield Memorial Hospital and Foundation. Uh, she's a recipient of multiple awards, including the 2023 SIU School of Medicine Leonard Tell Humanitarian Award, the 
2003 Athena Award, the J. Kevin Dorsey Teaching Award in 2022, and the Webster Award from the Springfield Chapter of the NAACP. In 2022, she was named uh, one of the women of influence by the Springfield Business Journal. She really has a passion for addressing health disparities and equities in healthcare and pursues this uh, relentlessly. And finally, um, she is a member of the Delta Sigma Theta sorority. I introduce to you my colleague and friend who has a great message for us today, Dr. Wendy Wills L. Lee. So before I get started, my mother asked me to make sure they can hear me in the back. <laughs> All right, great. Sociologist Lila Watson said, if you have come here to help me, you're wasting your time. If you have come knowing that your liberation is bound in mine, then let's work together. I want to thank God for giving me this opportunity to speak with you all today. I want to thank the Frontiers for choosing me to be the speaker for the 49th Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Breakfast. It is an even greater honor to know that Rosa Parks was sitting behind this podium 40 years ago. And four years ago, our beloved Dr. Wesley G. Robinson McNeese was behind this podium with his call to action. This has been an event that I have attended over 14 years with my three daughters, with the members of the Divine Nine, with my SIU colleagues. And this event was the first time when I walked in, I saw the power of my community. This historic event has spanned 49 years and I hope that in 100 years, these gold coats that we see will still be descending on this hotel ballroom. <coughs> Frontiers have a place that has invested in our youth, especially our boys. I want everybody in the room above, below the age of 18 to stand up for a second. Below the age of 18 to stand up. I want you to know that we hear you. We see you, and we are here to help you keep your dreams. So I'm an academic physician. I'm used to presenting with PowerPoint, so y'all have really stretched me today. <laughs> so um, one of the things you all are going to get today is my authentic self. As a physician, sometimes we don't get to be our authentic selves. So there are under 20 schools that are medical schools that actually have the Department of Medical Humanities in it. SIU School of Medicine happens to be one of those. We have been practicing what we call narrative medicine. We believe in storytelling. We believe that storytelling allows us to make the invisible visible. It gives us an opportunity to be more proximate. We talk a lot about the power of vicarious trauma, but it's within storytelling that we allow to really mirror vicarious trauma, but also vicarious resiliency. So today I'm gonna to share some of my stories. I'm a child raised on Langston Hughes, dream keeper. Maya Angelou, who said, when people show you who they are the first time, you better believe them. <laughs> She also said that when you know better, you do better. And Nikki Giovanni, whose dream was to discover something that no one else had. So she decided to become a poet and put things together in different ways that no one else had. So in my preparation, I learned that Dr. Martin Luther King actually was friends with Langston Hughes. They were really close friends. Langston Hughes actually wrote uh, his last letter to Dr. Martin Luther King before he died. I wonder if this served as inspiration. You all remember the poem, The Dream Keeper. I wonder if it had anything to do with Dr. Martin Luther King's dream. 
So one of the things I think about dream keepers, the initials are DK. I believe that there are two types of DKs in this world. Are you all ready? The two types of DKs are the dream keepers and the dream killers. There are two types of organizations in this world the dream keepers and the dream killers. There are two types of parents in this world, the dream keepers and the dream killers. There are two types of bosses in this world, the dream keepers and the dream killers. And last but not least, there are two types of cities in this world, those that help their citizens keep their dreams and those that let the dreams die. And unfortunately, sometimes dreams die in third grade. So as a physician, we talk a lot about heart disease being a silent killer. But I also believe that illiteracy is a silent killer too. So I want to share my positionality because it shapes the lens in the world and how I actually see it. So yes, I'm a family physician. I'm also an academic strategist. I'm the Associate Dean of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. I am tired. <laughs> so my invisible identities are that I'm a mother to three daughters. You all heard that I call them my earth, wind, and fire. I wanted them always to be acknowledged and to know that they were important. But to be honest, I did this out of fear. I didn't really want people to know their names because I wanted to always protect them. But I'm not afraid anymore. Samira, Ariana, and Yasmin. I do not walk in fear. I'm a single mother who has received profound support from my significant other, Bethy Wilson, his son, Quentin, my sorors, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, my friends, my church, and the Springfield community. But you know what? My children have actually been my greatest teachers. I'm a daughter of a physician, a physician who always saw every single patient regardless of whether or not they could pay. I'm the daughter of a teacher who believed that every child had potential and was willing to protect that potential. I'm the granddaughter of a woman who actually delivered babies. No, she was not trained, but nobody else was there to deliver the black babies. I'm a graduate of Hampton University at HBCU, a historically black college and university. And my first paper was actually about Fannie Lou Hammer. Fannie Lou Hammer was the youngest child of 20 children. And she coined the term that said, I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. <laughs> Y'all like that one. <laughs> But you know what, I now understand as a physician why she said this after being beaten for trying to vote. After receiving what we call the Mississippi appendectomy. That's a hysterectomy without her permission. She was speaking of the health impact of racism. She understood why our CDC last year declared that racism is a public health threat. Her favorite song was This Little Light of Mine. That's my favorite song, too. That got me through medical school. But I want to remind you all that every single person in here has a light. And you have no choice but to let it shine. I remind myself all the time of the most important question that I've ever heard. And that is, Dr. Manise really liked this one. Who were you before the world told you who you were supposed to be? <laughs> I try to fight against not making fear my compass. And this is why I must protect black history. Because black history is our history. And this is why we must teach it. So today I'm going to be a little vulnerable and I'm going to share a couple of pivotal stories in my life that have driven my work here at SIU as a physician committed to health disparities. You move through the world a little bit different when you become a mom. You become a fierce protector of your children and of others' children, so that when you're not here, the world is still loving on them. So story number one. Are you all ready? People don't know about these stories, but there's no PowerPoint, so here you go. 
In the fourth grade, I moved from a predominantly black neighborhood to a predominantly white neighborhood. One day at school, I was drinking out the water fountain. And I guess I was drinking out a little too long. And I was called the N-word for the first time by John. I didn't even know what the N-word meant, but I knew it was not my name. So I looked up, and I hit him. <laughs> so yes, I got in a little bit of trouble when I went home. I asked my mom what the N-word was, and she taught me my first critical lesson of always standing in my integrity, even around people who aren't for me. She said, you must forgive him. She said, Wendy, this is a learned behavior. He knows not what he does. He is just as good as you. Not you're just as good as him. I later learned his mother was very ill. I understand now that hurt people hurt people. She taught and commanded me, Bettina Wills, to search for the humanity and the potential in people, even the ones that were not for me. She said, you will love your enemy. And that's a lesson that I'm still working on. I'm still trying to embrace that. She did not know that I ever hit, that I hit him until I told her about this speech. <laughs> so I want to thank my mother, Rosa Park Strength here, for being my dream keeper. I also want to thank so many people in this room that have been my dream keeper. I'm an optimist, but I'm an optimist because if not, the world would probably crush my soul. So I try to have faith, and I have a deep-rooted belief in the potential of people. When I first moved here, I saw things happening with my children when I got them off the school bus, and I realized that I needed to be the one to get them off the school bus. I needed to be there to help them understand who and whose they were. I needed to protect their mind, body, and spirit. I needed to be their dream keeper. So I decided to push pause and become a stay-at-home mom. There were some who thought something had happened to me. Some, some people supported me, and others who encouraged me to take leadership roles in the community, and that's why I'm on so many boards. <laughs> because the Blackwell said, you need to know about the Community Foundation for the Land of Lincoln. You need to know about the YMCA. You need to know about the Boys and Girls Club. And so I was obedient to what was given to me. So we must support the organizations that support our youth. So one day, I was preparing for a health fair as a stay-at-home mom, and I put on a white coat. And my daughter Yasmin said, she said, why are you putting on a white coat? And I said, what do you mean? She said, doctors wear white coats. I said, I'm a doctor. <laughs> Lesson number one, always be your authentic self and make sure that your children know your full truth <laughs> and build environments that help you stand in your full truth. And when I moved here, I actually didn't have a whole lot of faith because I really wasn't sure what Springfield was about. I did not believe that there was a workplace that I could actually be a single mom, a woman leader, and a physician. I returned to work, fortunately, and Dr. Cruz was the dean. Dr. McNeese was boldly leading up equity, diversity, and inclusion. I got back up on the ramp at SIU School of Medicine, and they proved me wrong. It was a place willing to be innovative, supportive, creative. I applied for the position as equity, diversity, and inclusion dean, and Dr. Cruz declared that we would be an anti-racist institution. And all of this was before George Floyd. Dr. Mahoney, our president, declared that SIU would be an anti-racist institution and we would fight all forms of oppression. So what does it mean to be an anti-racist institution? It means that we're going to be committed, that we're going to collaborate, we're going to demand crucial conversations, and we're going to ask the hard questions and be transparent. We're going to let other people lead, we're going to be accountable to them. We're going to examine our history because we're not perfect. We're going to invest in unlocking potential. Being an anti-racist means that we are co-creating opportunities for learning and growth. It also says that we will re-envision our relationship with our community, but we're also going to re-envision our relationship with ourselves. 
Story number three. I'm the type of mom at the dinner table my oldest said to me in fourth grade, Mom, who is the KKK? I said, where did you get that from? She said, well, they were teaching us about black history. Being a first time mom, I could not understand why there wasn't a note that came home to tell me that they were going to be talking about such serious topics. But also being the daughter of a mother, where the KKK drove past her house every single Sunday, I had some vicarious trauma. So my three daughters and I, we were packed up in the car the next day, driving to the Martin Luther King Monument, 14 hours. I wanted to make sure that my children did not learn black history from a place of fear, but from a place of strength. <laughs> that same town is now at Howard University, now three miles away from that monument, studying political science, aspiring to be a lawyer. Samira, go ahead, wave your hand. So we know um, and very familiar with the trauma response or fight or flight, but the ones that people really talk about are freeze and submit. Now you heard that my natural response in fourth grade was apparently to fight. <laughs> Sometimes when I'm in shock with the things that I see and the things I hear about, I actually freeze. And this actually gives me compassion and understanding for people when they come in telling their stories. And they're traumatized, not by what they saw, but they're traumatized because they witnessed something and they didn't do anything about it because they froze. And that's why we must practice what to do when we see something that's wrong. We need to practice what to say. We need to practice what we're going to do. Because the most painful thing for people when they come into our equity support team is all of this happened in front of somebody and nobody said anything at all. Story four, when I came through high school, the history books, the old history books only taught us that we were slaves. So in my mind, to try to escape, I tried to say to myself, who would I have been if I was back in slavery? So of course, I picked Harriet Tubman. <laughs> Me and Harriet Tubman got really, really close to the point that when I was at University of Virginia, I saw no other black women physicians like me. So I carried a picture on a card of Harriet Tubman in my white coat pocket. Then one day I saw another African-American woman physician and I took that and she was having a really hard day in the elevator and I just slipped it in her pocket. And we started slipping it back and forth to each other whenever we saw it, <laughs> each other. The reason why I liked Harriet Tubman is that she said, when you hear the dogs barking, keep running. She also said, I have freed a whole lot of slaves. I would have freed even more if they knew they were slaves. So as a physician, one of the things I say is that I have healed a whole lot of people, but I would have healed so many more if they just knew they were sick. don't know they have hypertension. Most people with diabetes don't even know they have diabetes. So this is my last story. Dr. Martin Luther King Day was declared in 1983. My private school, let me preface things, our, our mascot was actually the Confederate soldier, so you know where I'm going with this, was not going to give us the day off, so I protested and did not go. That was in 1983. That was the day I realized that I could free myself. I had never worked or gone to school on Dr. Martin Luther King Day. I am donating my honorarium back to these boys in the corner because I don't want to get paid because I am not working on Dr. Martin Luther King Day. I also had a petition signed and turned it into my headmaster then. Black history is American history, and it's important. Back in the day, 
in those history books, they only taught us that our contribution were as slaves. Thank God I had parents that taught me otherwise. Those lessons ingrained in us as children sometimes show up as adults. So sometimes I found myself as an adult sitting in meetings, asking myself, who would this person next to me have been in slavery? Would they have helped me on the Underground Railroad? Would they have sold me from my mother? But later on I realized that I was, didn't have the language, I was looking for my allies. I do not teach my daughters that they were runaways. I teach them that they are freedom seekers. Did you know that there was actually a medical diagnosis called dracomania? Do you know what dracomania is? That's what they called the runaway slaves. There was a diagnosis for something that was natural to want to be free. And that's why we have to make sure that we do not pathologize what is normal. So the medical field, we have been working hard trying to eliminate bias. We have been working hard to reduce systemic barriers. The American Medical Association recently came out with um, a document called Advancing Health Equity. And one of the things it says is that science has advanced and evolved, so so much language and understanding. I love that we are developing person-centered language because language is important. It provides people the inherent respect for their humanity and dignity. So slaves, no, we were enslaved. Homeless are not homeless, they are unhoused. Incarcerated people or felons are not, they are justice-involved people. During COVID, it was illuminated that it was not race, but racism that was a driver for these disparities that we saw. It was the zip codes that people were living in. It was the jobs that they worked and what they had access to. So I want you all to remember that the narrative is very important. Don't forget that we were freedom seekers. We must humanize people. It is critical to see people outside of their roles for your success. So my litmus test, I always say is, do you know who takes out your trash? Do you know their names? Because if you don't, you really haven't been seeing people. So Dr. Martin Luther King, he is known as a drum major for peace. And if we let it, we could fall in that trap of seeing him as somebody that was bigger than life. So I don't want us to think about him being bigger than life. This was an ordinary man doing extraordinary things. So let's humanize him for a minute. Dr. Martin Luther King, he was a father of four. He was a husband. We know that he was shot and killed at 39, but did you know his daughter, his oldest daughter, was actually washing dishes at the age of 12 when she found out that her father was shot? See, we only talk about the singular. We have to think about the ripple effect of some of the violence that we have in the communities. His youngest was five years old. His brother was actually in the hotel room underneath him. This was a smart man. He actually skipped the ninth and the twelfth grade. He had a PhD by the age of 25. We know about him writing letters from Birmingham jail, but do you know that this man was actually incarcerated 29 times? One time for driving five miles per hour above the speed limit. So for my athletes, this man was the quarterback. He was a football player, he was a basketball player. And he actually, from my first responders back there, he wanted to be a fireman. So he actually understood the importance of the urgency of now. And he always wanted to rescue people. Did you know that his mother grieved him, but six years later, she was actually shot at the Ebenezer Baptist Church while she was playing piano. So as a physician, I became very curious about the question. What was the environment that actually made a man like Dr. Martin Luther King? This is what we need to analyze. So there's something called the Childhood Opportunity Index. I'm going to say that again. The Childhood Opportunity Index. This is something that maps out the quality of life in the neighborhoods in our community. The people who developed it actually believe that every child had potential, 
and deserve the equal opportunity to grow and learn. Neighborhoods matter. They talk about the geography of childhood opportunities and defined by quality schools, parks so that children can play, playgrounds, clean air, and access to healthy food, health care, and housing. The most important time in a child's life is between zero and three years old. And this is why we need to focus on early childhood opportunities. What's happening in a child's life in third grade, that child will be the same place when they graduate unless we have programs like the Frontiers, programs like the Boys and Girls Club, programs like the Outlet. We have to really look for the interventions. So Dr. Martin Luther King, he lived in an intergenerational household with his mother, his grandmother. He took piano from his mother, who actually was a graduate of Hampton University. He was a middle child. You have to watch those middle children. <laughs> he was invested in his education, but more importantly, he was in an educational system that recognized his intellectual abilities. Him being the quarterback, this was a man that understood strategy. So when we look back at history, one of the challenges I have is that we start to look about these singular events. We say, oh yeah, the March on Washington. But I need us to get a little bit more granular. It was the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. Jobs and freedom. There were over 250,000 people that were they, there that day at that march. There were 10 demands that were given to Kennedy. There were artists like Mahalia Jackson who told Martin, tell him about the dream. That wasn't scripted. Somebody interrupted and said, tell them about the dream. There were people that looked just like this room in that audience. There were Christians. There were Jewish individuals. There were Muslim individuals. There were people of all races. And that's why we have to remain together. Martin spoke out against Vietnam, so we know what he would be saying about this war that we have been witnessing. So Dr. King, out of all the professions, said medicine was the most inhumane injustice. He had observed multiple families actually die from TB. And as a black woman, I'm more likely to die than any other ethnic or racial group from heart disease. I'm two times more likely to get diabetes. I'm three times more likely to die in childbirth. This is real. We need everybody in here to make sure they're going to the doctor. And when you look at our community health needs assessment, it says that maybe only 50% of people are going to the doctor once a year. We must be intentional. One of the things that I believe is that our Springfield Central Illinois African American Museum is extremely important. We must continue to understand our history. So in my work, I found that there's barriers to racial justice and equity. Shame is a barrier. Shame is a barrier. Being uncomfortable can be a barrier. Ego, not able to admit they were wrong and course correct. We must own our mistakes. Justice means making it right. We must make it right. So when I come back here next year to celebrate the Frontier's 50th anniversary, my question to you is, were you a dream killer or a dream keeper? When times are hard for me, I do not allow myself to get amnesia. I reflect on my history. My history is that somebody laid in the bottom of a slave ship called Doddington so that I could be in front of this podium today. So I have learned a few things recently from Trisha Hershey. She said that rest is resistance. If we do not rest, we're not going to be sustainable. If we do not rest, we're not going to have the ability to imagine the possibilities and develop the clarity we need. Brittany Cooper introduced me to something called eloquent rage. I used to not want to be labeled an angry black woman. After being told, you look angry, I started trying to fix my face. Now, one of the things I realize, that's a correct assessment. I 
am angry. I'm angry that Spring Hill has one of the highest segregation indexes in the United States of America. This is for you, Senator Dick Durbin. I'm angry, so you gotta stop them, that there are all these laws against diversity, equity, and inclusion. So thank you for saying diversity matters. So yes, the burden is heavy, and this is why we must all carry it together so that it does not break one person's back. We need to protect our minds, our bodies, and our souls. So I told you that Samira is actually at Howard University. Her first year, they started bombing, having bombing threats. And the one generation said, oh, keep going, we're used to this. But remember, Maya said, when we know better, we must do better. So Howard University, they have mental health days now. They have mental health therapies working with the students. And this is what we need to do. Because when you think about it, Dr. Martin Luther King died at the age of 39. But when they did his autopsy, they said he had a heart of a 60-year-old. Do you all remember Eric Garner? I can't bring you. Thank you, ma'am. Eric Garner's died. Daughter died at the age of 29. Something is going on. Dr. Geronimus taught us that there's something called the very weathering very profound. Effect. The weathering effect is people just get beat down and tired. So we I must protect our minds, our bodies, and our spirit. Because what I do in the hospital, what I do in the clinic, we need to open our minds to people to understand everything else that matters is that what the history of this country, no matter how ugly, is what the house does. The does. It's what people who are securing we need food. to fight against going back. It's people who are who are foundations, we need not let making sure that people are being resources to a right place. place. There are we political determinants of health. They're social We're getting ready to sing. We so as I come, come to a close, I need I you everybody to listen to and understand those words. They too are very profound. I need, I need you to remember, remember that, that God that does not choose the qualified, but he qualifies that are the color. chosen. We not stay in for the when you're overwhelmed, I need you to stand. Ahead. Don't turn your back on because the truth, but reason. stand. Don't turn us. your back on the story of our community, but stand. We need Listen to and believe people when they tell you what's happening. We have a very we good must job. embrace we humanity. We are all Thank inextricably you. linked. Um, so stand in your truth. Stand in your power. Gonna be led by when I was nine it. years old, I allowed somebody to push me out of my integrity. But now that I'm 52, I know how to have eloquent rage. I know how to stand, and we must all stand and refuse to ever let anyone push us out of our integrity. Thank you.
but because I have the mic. <laughs> I want to say to our young people, you know, there's a saying that says, I know, I know that person. Name, you name drop. I know that person. But what's the truth? It's not about who you know. It's about who knows you. Make yourselves known. Thank you to all of the data. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We shall overcome. I'm not in the scripture before we meet them. Second Chronicles 7 and 14 says, Give my people.
Yeah. And the reason I said that before I pray, because I can see what God is doing. We in prayer every Thursday for our uh, city officials out there. And Bishop Franklin, bringing the ministers in this community together. In our meeting, we can see all races coming together being united as one. How do you know that united we stand? But divided we will fall. But the devil is alive. <laughs> Springfield will stand. And we will be healed. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Father God, for everything that you have done. And we thank you, God, for what you're getting ready to do. We ask asking you right now, God, in the name of Jesus. Before we do anything, we're asking you to forgive us of all of our sins. Seen and unseen, oh God. Because sometimes, God, we don't get it right. Sometimes, God, we don't talk right. Sometimes, God, we don't walk right. Sometimes, God, we don't think right. So we're asking you right now in the name of Jesus to forgive us. Give us a repentant heart. Father God, you said in your word, how I know you that it's just good for brotherings to dwell together. So we thank you, God, for bringing us together. We thank you, God, for the frontier organization. We thank you, God, for all the leaders of God of this state. Father, I'm asking you in the name of Jesus to heal your God. You know exactly what we're standing in need of. You know, oh God, what we've been praying for. You know, God, what we have to deal with on a daily basis. Father, we thank you. Now, Father, you said you were if we had in your name, you said you will do it. Father God, I'm asking you to heal us. You know what we're standing in need spiritually, physically, financially, socially, emotionally, in every area of our life. Bless our children. Bless our nation. Bless our state. Bless our county. Bless this city. And Father, we promise to give you praise. We give you all the honor, O oh God. And we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, we pray. Benediction. May the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord make his face to shine upon thee. May the Lord be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up his countenance unto thee and give thee peace. In the name of Jesus. Amen. May God bless you.
Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and molehill of Mississippi. 